Hello, and welcome to the second part of the Baraha Transformations video. The main points of this video do stand on their own to some degree, but if you haven't watched the first part, I would highly recommend watching it first before diving into this one. With that intro out of the way, let's begin. In the last video, we found a surprising pattern which occurs when repeatedly applying the following transformation. For some fixed constant k, we take an input x and bring it to k minus k over x. As it turns out, when the constant k is of the form 2 plus 2 cosine of 2 pi over n, this transformation is actually periodic. Applying it n times gives back the original value. For example, when k is 1, applying the transformation which takes x to 1 minus 1 over x, applying this transformation 3 times gives back your original value x. Last time, we explained this with hyperbolic geometry, visualizing k minus k over x as rotations of the hyperbolic plane. In this video, Alex will be explaining an alternative way to be the structure behind these transformations, using methods that may be a little more familiar to some of you. And he explains how this technique relates to a more general method of problem solving. So without further ado, Alex, take it away. Our transformation takes one fraction and returns to us a new fraction. This causes an interplay between the numerators and denominators that we might be able to see if we write x as the ratio of two numbers. If we write x as a numerator n divided by a denominator d and simplify, we end up with a new numerator and a new denominator. The new numerator is kn minus kd, and the new denominator is n. We can write this as a system of linear equations in n and d, so applying k minus k over x is equivalent to doing this to the numerator and denominator. Using matrix notation, it looks like this. We have a linear transformation on our hands. With that in mind, it makes much more sense to ask, is k minus k over x a rotation of the vector n d by 2 pi over n? For example, if n was 4, this linear transformation might amount to a rotation by 2 pi over 4. Repeated applications of a linear transformation might start to look like an eigenvalue eigenvector problem to some of you. Most linear transformations can be completely described by their eigenvectors, which are just some funny vectors that stay pointing in the same direction after the transformation and are only scaled in length. The eigenvalue describes how much each eigenvector is scaled by, and it may be negative or even complex. As an example, a 2 by 2 matrix will usually have two eigenvectors. Let's say our eigenvectors are these red vectors, with eigenvalues 2 and negative 1. Then performing our transformation amounts to morphing the space such that these two vectors end up here. If the transformation scales the first eigenvector by lambda 1, and this blue vector has a large component pointing in the same direction as the first vector, then that component should also be scaled by lambda 1. Likewise, the component pointing along the other eigenvector should be scaled by its eigenvalue, lambda 2. This alternative way of viewing our transformation can be thought of as decomposing the matrix into three components. We first project onto the eigenvectors using the inverse of this matrix whose columns are the eigenvectors. Then we scale the projection by how much the eigenvectors are respectively scaled by the transformation. Then we project back into the original coordinates. What happens when you apply the transformation more than one time? Well, as you can imagine, this just means that we scale those eigenvectors more than once. And this is what happens algebraically as well. Since the left and right hand side represent the same transformation of our vector, they're equal. 
and this holds in general, no matter n. So we say that the linear transformation represented by the matrix k minus k 1 0 to the n is equal to the transformation represented by the product of the three matrices on the right that projects onto the eigenvectors, scales those eigenvectors by lambda to the n, and projects back into the original basis. Remember that we defined n over d to be equal to x. So as long as n over d equals x, it represents the same thing. It doesn't matter if we scale by 2, or even point the vector 180 degrees out of phase, or multiply by any non-zero constant. In this linear algebra framework, we can now reframe our problem in a much nicer way. We want the vector after n transformations to be a multiple of the original vector. We can now use what we just learned about eigenvectors and eigenvalues to make repeated applications of the transformation very simple. Simplifying, we find that both eigenvalues to the power of n are equal to the same constant. They're equal. This is our new formulation of the problem. Compare this to doing the algebra to solve for k in the general case, where we had a messy, multi-layer fraction equation with a variable number of layers. Now, our problem reduces to finding when lambda 1 to the n equals lambda 2 to the n, where lambda 1 and lambda 2 are the eigenvalues of the matrix. The eigenvalues turn out to be the roots of a certain quadratic relating to the matrix, called the characteristic polynomial. In this case, they're 1 half k plus or minus the square root of k times k minus 4. Now, we want some sort of periodic behavior when we take lambda 1 and lambda 2 to the nth power, so our eigenvalues should be complex. As a brief reminder of why, when we multiply two complex numbers, their magnitudes multiply as usual but their angles add. So raising a complex lambda to the nth power amounts to rotating by some angle theta n times, along with scaling the length of lambda. Since we want the imaginary part to be non-zero, k times k minus 4 must be negative, which means k is between 0 and 4. These possible values of k are already starting to look like what we saw before. The magnitude of the eigenvalue is the length of the black line, which can be calculated using the Pythagorean theorem like this. And the important quantity, the angle, is the inverse tangent of the ratio of the side lengths of the triangle. The angle is positive or negative depending on which eigenvalue you're looking at. Let's take, for example, n equals 4. Then the angle of our eigenvalues is pi over 4. So that when we raise each eigenvalue to the power of 4, they end up being equal. Since we know lambda 1 and lambda 2 have the same magnitudes, we know that their nth powers will have the same magnitudes. And all we need to do is ensure that their angles are plus or minus pi over n. So there you have it. The values of k to obtain a period of n are 2 plus 2 cosine of 2 pi over n. But more than the pretty result is the surprising structure underneath if we just frame it in the right light. In the previous video, the whole hypothetical about the physics student bored after a test stumbling across this periodicity while playing on his calculator, surprise, that was me. <laughs> and despite my best efforts, any sort of explanation eluded me for months. Until, for one reason or another, I started thinking about it again for a few days and came to a proof of the phenomenon. And yes, it was the ugly route of going through the algebra of nested fractions, so it took many, many hours. I showed it to Justin, and he magically returned to me with two new problems, one about hyperbolic geometry 
and one about the linear algebra we explored today, both of them solved in a day. And I think there's a historical figure who would have something to say about this. He said, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. Let's call Einstein's fate-determining problem F, a difficult problem. Then he would decompose it into something like this, where G is the difficult task of determining the proper question. H is an easy problem, and G inverse takes the answer to the easy problem and reframes it in the context of the original problem F. We did this twice in our problem, first in discovering that this is a linear transformation when you write x in terms of two new variables, n and d, and then again when we rewrote our linear transformation in terms of what it does to the eigenvectors. This is a powerful technique to solve difficult problems, and it's even better for dynamic problems. If our problem f is repeated application of a difficult problem little f, then we can decompose big H into many little h's. Einstein's insight becomes more valuable as more repetitions of f are applied, because no matter how many iterations are performed, the difficult part of deciding how to frame the question only needs to be performed once. This is in general a very powerful technique to solve dynamic problems, change variables. This particular case, where the quotient of our new variables is the original variable, is called homogeneous coordinates, and it's used all the time in computer graphics. It basically adds one dimension to the coordinate system in a way that makes projective geometry much easier to describe. When applied to dynamic problems, like the one we just saw, the idea of changing variables relates closely to something called Koopman theory, a growing field of math that aims to model nonlinear system using linear dynamics. In the context of Koopman theory, Little f might be some nonlinear function that describes how your dynamical system changes from one time step to the next. If you want to be able to predict that system into the future, it would be very helpful for the system to be linear, so you can apply that same trick using the eigenvectors and eigenvalues that we explored in this video. Koopman theory tells us that there exists a g such that h is linear. Specifically, there is some way that you can take your variables into a higher dimensional, potentially infinite space where it evolves linearly. There will typically be this trade-off between dimensionality and linearity, so that highly nonlinear, chaotic systems like the Earth's atmosphere will require infinite dimensional h to properly describe its dynamics linearly. Now, taking a step back, we just discovered a problem involving simple subtraction and division, something that the Babylonians might have noticed 5,000 years ago. And we ultimately found that in order to really understand what was going on, we needed math that was invented in the last two or three hundred years. And remind yourself that cosines showed up with no semblance of a circle in the original problem, with no need for some human to come in and impose this new concept. No, the constants that produce the periodic behavior just are 2 plus 2 cosine of 2 pi over n. And it just happens that it would take thousands of years for mathematicians to discover the tools of linear algebra and hyperbolic geometry that best describe why this is the case. To me, this journey showed that the mathematics we know is not just driven by our human biases towards elegant geometry and physical intuitions, but is actually fundamental, in a sense more general than our universe, and can be encountered in something as simple as repeated subtraction and division.